I appreciate this opportunity to speak at the PIS Optics Conference. My name is John Hedengren, and I'll be talking about hybrid machine learning and fundamental or physics-based modeling in the oil and gas industry, specifically with drilling automation. A convergence of technologies is creating an opportunity to use sophisticated mathematical models within automation and monitoring. Significant challenge is the size of the physics-based models that have too many adjustable parameters or too slow in simulation to extract actionable information. This presentation shows how fit-for-purpose models can be used directly in automation and optimization solutions. These models can unlock new ways of thinking. Hybrid modeling harnesses the strengths of both physics-based and data-informed modeling approaches to produce higher accuracy, but there are challenges that come with the opportunities. Automation is transforming many industries. Surgeons are directing robots in operations with improved precision. Drones are delivering goods in new ways. Technology companies are working on systems to change how we buy and receive products with automated delivery. Automation is transforming medical care, transportation, inspection, and retail. There are many applications of machine learning in these automation solutions, and I've listed a few of them on the right. It changes how we interact with computers and how computers are able to give us useful and interesting information. Let's review, first of all, why we would want to implement digitalization and automation. In drilling industry, it's health, safety, and environmental reasons. We can also leverage some of the economic aspects of automation to operate closer to constraints with shorter drilling time, especially with challenging market conditions. There have been many recent successes with reported greater accuracy and consistency of drilling operations, faster drilling with fewer interruptions, and more accurate directional drilling. Automation doesn't happen all in one step. Let's talk about the stages of machine automation. In level one, we have uh, in Sheridan's 10 levels of automation, we have that the computer just carries out the command. And level two, the computer also gets options. And level three, the computer also selects actions. And then this is what the human does here on the left. And as you see, during higher levels of automation, the computer does more and more of the task. So let's look at levels 5, 8, and 10. In level 10, the computer is in charge. The computer will tell the action if the computer approves, versus level 8, the human can still request justification for why the computer is doing something. So let's look at this. Um, clip that shows a person in a vehicle. You'll notice that this individual is not touching the gas or brake pedal and is operating at a level 8. So the person could take control at any time and also request from the vehicle, you know, where are you going and why are you doing that? And at a certain point, when the person enters the parking lot, the individual will leave the vehicle then the vehicle will go into a level 10 mode where it goes to find a parking spot and park itself. So this is a good illustration of different levels of automation. Now you can see on the right, I'm just going to highlight this. Uh, right here you can see the left, the medium, range camera, and then also the right rearward camera. Now you can see that it's identifying objects of interest. You can see other vehicles, pedestrians, signs. And so it's using something called machine learning classification to be able to understand the situation around it and be able to act appropriately. So can we do the same thing in other industries, applying some of this technology to something like drilling? So we want to leverage digitalization for automation solutions. Let's talk about how to deploy automation. With any automation system, there are three essential elements. 
there is the sensor, the actuator, and the controller, or the computer. And there are many considerations. Uh, open or proprietary system, centralized or distributed, simple or complex. Now in the drilling uh, situation, we have different actuators, like the weight on bit. We have a mud pump. We have rotation speed. And the things that we want to try to regulate are things like the pressure down at the bit and also the flow uh, to be able to avoid things like kicks. So in all of these industries, there are going to be advances in sensors and actuators. And I'll just share one point of reference here. If a self-driving vehicle, that might be producing something like 25 gigabytes an hour of data. A wind farm is going to produce you know, maybe on the order of 150,000 data points every second. And then a jet engine, 51,000 gigabytes per hour of data as it looks to have early detection of problems. Now, the same thing is data increase has happened in the drilling industry as well. You can see mud pulse telemetry. You know, it was popular up through the 80s and 90s with some additional uh, acoustic signals or electromagnetic telemetry. And then there's been a big step change in the data available with something called wired drill pipe, where they embed a coaxial cable into the drill stream. So this step change, let me go ahead and erase some of these circles before I play this. A step change has enabled new ways of, auto, of applying automation because the data is available. High-speed data that's also bi-directional. So now you can see what's happening along the string, but also uh, downhole at the bit where uh, the bit is encountering new formations or other types of information are important to know. There are also actuators. So for example, managed pressure drilling, you're closing off the drill string to make it a closed system versus an open one. And as a result, you have another actuator, which is this choke valve right here that allows you to regulate the pressure. You can close the choke valve and then be able to adjust the pressure down here at the bottom hole. So you have new types of actuators that are also coming into play to transform the industry. Now, why would you want to maintain the pressure at the bit down here at the bottom? So this uh, illustration shows this as you close the choke valve, you increase the pressure at the surface, and that increases the pressure down below. And you can stay within a window, for example, between a collapse pressure or overburden pressure or tighter fracture pressure and pore pressure. So it helps you regulate uh, the area that you're interested in. Now some situations are easier than others. So when you have wide pressure margins, this is a relatively easy scenario where you don't necessarily have to have tight control versus others where you have a very narrow pressure margin, you need to have very tight control. I'll talk about a case study later where uh, the automation enabled a, a drilling campaign that wasn't otherwise possible. Now, if you don't have data, there's also the possibility of using soft sensors. So this is maybe the most natural way of using simulators as digital twins to the process to be able to collect data that wouldn't otherwise be available or to help validate data potentially corrupted. So digital twins have also been used quite extensively both in the drilling world but also in other industries as well. So let, now that we have data and sensors, let's talk about the algorithms now. So current industrial control system automation includes sequence control for startup and shutdown or batch processes, feedback control for continuous systems, maybe feed forward elements to anticipate disturbances. But one of the most common algorithms is the PID controller, 
that is very standard. It's like um, uh, uh, it is feedback control. So it's like driving a car while looking backwards. Okay, so you see in, you see a measurement that just happened. You make a correction. So you're trying to stay inside the lanes, and you see that you might be varying to the left or to the right, and so you make corrections as you take observations. Now there's new out there are new algorithms that uh, have enabled new ways of using this data, not only to understand where you are, but also to help you predict into the future. So there, this is a map of machine learning. One of the issues with machine learning is developments are happening so fast it can be hard to stay up with the latest technologies. Also, some vendors uh, don't necessarily uh, share all the information about their solutions, so it can be difficult to understand what is actually happening underneath the hood of the application. But generally, the two that are most um, commonly applied right now are things that are in the regression and classification. Now, if you have labeled data, you can do classification. If you don't have labeled data, then you'd use unsupervised methods, and those are typically referred to as clustering. Then there's also dimensionality reduction as well through principal component analysis. I'll do a demonstration just to make this a little bit more practical and uh, relatable. So this is a temperature control lab. It's a little physical device that uh, we've produced and it has two actuators, two heaters, and two temperature sensors. The little temperature sensors are right here attached to the actuators. So it's a simple case of feedback control or also predictive control that we'll share as well. Now one of the first things in machine learning is data quality. Be able to ensure the data quality that it's um, the actuators are actually doing the things that they reported they were doing. So this is an application of that so where we have the temperature and we're trying to estimate uh, we're trying to predict when the heater was actually on or off to make sure it was functioning correctly. So you can see we've used the temperature value and the derivatives. And at a certain point here, we'll start after the training period, we'll start using our classifiers. Okay, so this is classifying when the heater is on or off. And some of these, the bottom three, we didn't tell it the boundaries between those. We had it try to figure out on or off itself. Okay, whereas the other ones, we told it the on or off during the training. So logistic regression, naive base, stochastic gradient descent, and so on uh, are all supervised learning methods versus these last three are unsupervised. So let me just play this again. So here we're learning, we give it the heater on or off for the supervised learning methods. And then at a certain point, we have it try to predict um, without using this information, whether the heater is on or off. And so you can see at this point at 30 minutes, it turns on, you can see they're doing a fairly good job of lining up. It says that it's on when it's on and off when it's off. The unsupervised learning methods are not working as well and some of them are swapped okay on or off is swapped but you can see overall they're generally doing a fairly good job okay so once we have things like models we can use those in control applications but I want to compare the historical way of doing things to maybe some things that are uh, we can do with machine learning especially these hybrid models so this is an example of PID temperature control, where we adjust maybe the P, I, and D parameters and uh, let the automation take over. So I'm going to forward it just a little bit, and you can see that it's trying to reach the set point. And at a certain point, it's going to overshoot a little bit. It didn't anticipate that it put in too much heat and even though it dropped the heater value, the temperature kept on rising. 
Okay, and you can see that the heater value is continuing to drop here. But this is not any information that is learned now. The PID controller would do the exact same thing the next time. So can we use this data and leverage it to have the automation system learn and adapt as we go? Okay, so talking about adaptive or predictive controllers, we want to develop a mathematical representation of our process. This is often referred to as a digital twin. Now in conventional feedback control, that's like PID controllers driving while looking backwards. Versus predictive control, you want to be able to see into the future constraints or targets that you're going to try to hit and the move plan, how you're going to get there. So this is an example of model predictive control where we see into the future, we make corrective actions now, maybe small adjustments to help prevent a constraint later. And many companies have already implemented model predictive control. But one of the issues is the cost of developing models and maintaining those. So there are ways that I'll discuss here about how to do this for drilling and some of the applications that we've encountered. So challenges and opportunities. Sometimes the process is very nonlinear. And this is the case with drilling as well. And you can see an example of this nonlinearity here with the choke valve opening. And then as you increase, increase the mud pump flow rate, you get a very nonlinear region right here that um, causes problems for the controller. So very small valve changes when it's nearly closed are going to cause very large changes in the pressure downhole. So what are the opportunities? We have a lot of data and these sophisticated mathematical models. Uh, how can we combine those into solutions for automation? One of the opportunities is that computing hardware and optimization algorithms are getting faster. Optimization benchmark problems are able to be solved 2.5 billion times faster than they were 30 years ago. And this is on a data set of mixed integer linear programming problems. The very same problems are be able to be solved so much faster because of Moore's Law, 17,000 times faster, and optimizer improvements, 150,000 times faster. So combining these, we can solve much larger, more sophisticated problems much faster. Also, there are very good machine learning algorithms that have been developed that we can use the data and be able to do regression or classification. This is a classification example where you can see we're trying to distinguish between the orange dots and the blue dots. Okay, and so this machine learning, it's going to try to learn the difference between those based on these input features. And you can see additional neurons in this neural network are needed to be able to resolve the classification problem. Now, at a certain point, I'll also show, okay, this is a, an additional layer. This is called deep learning if you have multiple layers of the neural network. And you can see it does a better job of the classification. Okay, adding a few more neurons, just one more training. You can see the loss function up top. As that drops uh, to zero, it means you have a perfect fit. Okay, now let's say you had some kind of physics-based information about the problem. Okay, you knew that x1 times x2 was a good input feature. Maybe that came from some type of knowledge about the process. So can we leverage this type of physics-based information in doing the classification or regression problems for machine learning? So there have been many advances in these physics-based models. The question is, can we leverage those together with the data to provide better optimization solutions? Now here you can see a modeling of a phenomenon called backward whirl. This is a sophisticated model that's trying to 
understand the effect of interaction with the borehole. And you can see as it starts to spin like this, it gets into something called backward whirl, where it spins in the opposite direction of the drilling, which can damage the drill string. So the main idea here is that we need fit-for-purpose models for automation, not physics-based, full physics-based models that are maybe too difficult to calculate in real time, but these lower-order machine-learned models that maybe have a physics-based foundation but are informed by data. Now, in this plot, you can see the model and the measured values right here. Now, the measured values, those are like a soft sensor from one of these high-fidelity physics-based models. And the red line, that is the machine learned model. So during this first part of the time period, the model is learning from the simulator. And once it learns that, it's able to track the, the uh, pressure very well. And the benefit of that is that now you have just a few differential equations with parameters that are being estimated from the full physics-based model and updated occasionally just to keep it in line with what's actually going on in the process. So this is the temperature control lab again in action. We have something like a physics-based model, maybe a finite element analysis model that does sophisticated heat transfer calculations and be able to predict the temperature. But that's too slow to be able to be used in real time. So what we do is we extract with unknown parameters that we can adjust. And we adjust those with something called moving horizon estimation that, that is able to learn and adapt the model as you go from the data. And then you predict forward into the future with something like model predictive control to be able to drive you to the desired target. So applying this to um, the pressure control of managed pressure drilling, we are able to adjust the choke in order to try to drive to the set point. Okay, so the set point is changing here and we're adjusting the choke up top side in order to be able to meet that pressure. Now you'll see here that the mud pump is not typically used in coordination with the choke. So what this did is allowed us to answer a question. What if we allowed it to coordinate with the choke? What would be the result in terms of meeting these set points? Now you can see that it's able to take smaller valve adjustments and coordinate with the pump to be able to meet the set point faster and more reliably. So a new way of thinking that machine learned models can provide is this multivariate concept of instead of having just one controller and another one that are separate, what can we do to combine those into a single application where it's able to coordinate action? So we developed a scenario that was based around a uh, large gas influx even larger than the BP Maconda well incident. The choke valve and the pumps are traditionally adjusted to control pressure and the drill string weight on bit and RPM are adjusted to control rate of penetration. But when we combine the two into the unified strategy, the controller had a surprising outcome that challenged our conventional thinking. We performed a simu this simulation study and combined them let the optimizer try to suggest a solution. So the two things that it did were to reduce the kick with immediate uh, choke closing, but it also did something that was surprising. It also started to rotate the drill string faster. And we didn't anticipate that. So we brought that to experts, expert drillers. And we said, this is the thing that we observed, what do you think about that? They said, actually, that's correct. We don't normally do that, but if you increase the rotation of the drill string, it's going to increase the friction factor, 
which is going to cause an immediate and long string uh, increase in the pressure to control the gas that, that uh, has influx into the borehole. So it was able to discover something that uh, expert operators already knew. Then the other thing that it did was it also was able to increase the rate of penetration because it knew that if it could drop if it could drop the pressure to the poor pressure, a lower pressure would also cause faster drilling. So here's just one case study. This is an example of how digitalization and new control strategies uh, enable projects like this one in Southeast Asia. Now, this was a very tight margin drilling uh, reservoir. The only way that they were able to drill this was with very tight pressure control. They used wired drill pipe and were able to control the bit pressure to plus or minus one bar, which is about plus or minus one atmosphere or 15 PSI and plus or minus three bar during pipe connection procedures, which are more challenging, especially with the heave of the ship. So let's review some of the challenges and opportunities of predictive automation. Challenges are that it requires digitalization as a foundation and high quality data. And also automation, especially based on machine learned models can become unreliable if the control model is not calibrated or it's not sufficiently accurate or if the predictive controllers fail to converge. To address th some of these challenges, we combine the strengths of physics-based and machine-learned models. We use things like classification and digital twins to identify anomalies in process data or even operator actions. So in conclusion, automation it leads to greater accuracy and consistency with faster drilling and fewer interruptions. The three essential elements for automation are sensors, actuators, and controllers. And predictive automation and optimization, they need fit-for-purpose modeling that use the combined strengths of physics-based but also machine-learned models. And there are many remaining challenges and opportunities for these combined or hybrid systems. So thank you for your attention, and I'll be glad to take any questions.